Yeah, welcome back, Sergio, for the second and uh, unfortunately last session, at least this term. <laughs> so I'm going to explain quickly the EI question exporting geometry. So I'm going to explain that quickly, and then we're going to jump back into Unreal and continue where we left off, which I think it was the master material that we were doing. So we'll do a little bit of materials, and then we'll talk about cameras, and sequencer and how to maybe use Ansel as well because I assume you want to get amazing images from this not only real time probably once nice images from the portfolio maybe also really quickly how to do 360s or 360s stereos because you might not have access to a vibe all the time or oculus so you can just get a card work for the presentation or so that that that's not really easy once it's set up so if we set up in those computers here, it'll be ready for you to use. So once once we set up Ansel, which is a plugin that we built in, uh, it's just like hitting a key and you get instant amazing and unlimited resolution, resolution images. And that's probably uh, it for today. So let's, let's start. Great. So first of all, uh, just really quickly, this question, well, if any other if you have any other question before we start, uh, now is the time. Let's just solve this one quickly. Um, so he's asking me that he has this module made of a few made of a, a, a few pieces, and when he exported as as FBX into Unreal, it appears with the pivot point off center, and every piece is one element, which is a common problem, although. We did explain this the other day, but I'll explain it again because it's a very important part of the process. So first of all, if you want your objects, if you export four objects or three objects or many objects at the same time, if you want them to be a single object, you have two options. One option is to make to merge them together in your program, MyR Max, but you can collapse them into one. That's the option number one. And it's the ideal one because when you do that, you, you will be able to uh, rearrange the UVs in UV2 so the light maps are in the right place. The other option is when you import it in Unreal, you need to tick the box um, collapse meshes. So let's do it quickly. <coughs> Right, so you have a, uh, a cylinder with a, a box and well, whatever, something like that. So if this is your module or something like that, which is what you have. And let's say that you have another thing like this. <coughs> so the, the thing that you just showed me was this, something like this. So you had your object here and the pieces like that. So if I export this, the pivot point of this object is going to be in 0, 0, 0. The pivot point of this one here and the pivot point of this one there. And they will appear as three different objects in Unreal. So if I want this to, to be one object, I can just center the whole thing. So if I center the whole thing, the pivot point, I mean, I can't do it accurately. The pivot point, if I export it from here, the pivot point of the whole thing is going to be here. So the pivot point of an object is always in relation to 0, 0, to the world 0, 0, right? So if I export this thing, it will be there. So to fix it, just manually center because it's going to be modular. If you create several like several objects in the same file, then it's just all of them are going to be stacked on top of the. Well, let's say that we have this. Let's go step by step. Let's say this is my modular column or whatever, yeah. and I know that is this is going to be it, and I'm I'm going to unwrap it. 
So first of all, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to merge those things together. So I'm going to, I could just select everything and go to tools and go collapse. I could go to the tools and say collapse and collapse all the objects into one. So now this is one unique object, right? So I now, know, sorry, wait, I don't know what tools are. Well, you can Google it, okay. right? This is, as we said, this is not about modeling. This is about workflows. Attach, collapse, merge, whatever. You can do it in any software. The, the tool itself is not important. What's important is the concept. So now this object is one object. So the thing is, remember that we are always doing UV number two, so we can have nice light maps. If this object is three objects, I would have three light maps, right? But it's only one. So now that I've uh, converted it into one, I could, as I did before, put my unwrap modifier and unwrap the whole thing into one, um, sorry, what am I, into one UV sheet, so it would be, whatever, I would reorganize it nicely, but let's say that this is my, <coughs> I would put it again just to copy it. So remember, that will be always in map channel number two. So this is one of the pieces, right? So I've made the, the UVs, I've centered, now it's ready to export. You're saying, if I have different objects, so if I've assembled, well, if it's modular, you don't need to assemble the scene, right? So if my other module is something like that, let's say, this is a completely different piece, whatever it is. When, in the moment when I'm gonna export this, I also need to center it. And I'll export it from here. So, let's say that I have all my modules. Those are my modules, right? So I have two pieces. So if I select those two pieces and go file, export, select it, I'm gonna call this just modules. Then I come here, I go to my meshes folder, and I import uh, my modules. If I don't click on combine meshes, those two pieces are gonna come as separate pieces, which is what I want in this particular case, right? I want every module to be one piece. If I click combine pieces, so I'm gonna do it the wrong way, so you see it. So if I click here, combine meshes, they are both in the same static mesh, which in this case is incorrect, right? In this case, I wanted exactly the opposite. So I would go here and say, sorry, let's put it there. In the, uh, mesh import data, I will untick combine meshes and I, I will go asset reimport modules, and it's not working. Well, let's just do it again. File new asset import modules. Now, if I antic combine meshes. There are two different pieces, right? And they both have the pivot point in the right place. Yep. All good? Kind of clear or not clear? In Unreal. So when you import, yeah. Cool. All right. So let's find the level that we had the other day. Is it this one? Any other question? Another question about Yep. So what's the question? Because the problem I always have is that when I export it as an installation of the video, I can never open it in my computer or any other computer. I just open it in this computer. Sorry, I don't think I understand what the problem is. So you... When I export, like, my package this, 
So how do you do? You go to file, bill, Windows 64. Okay, and where, where do you, and you get an executable file, yeah. and where do you try to open it? Well, in the Mac it doesn't work because you are packaging for Windows. Just put it in a USB drive and we'll try it here and we'll see why. So actually, we should maybe look into that today, how to package your project. Um, so is it possible to package it for Mac? Yes, you can. So when you go file package project, you need to just choose uh, iOS. Yeah, I tried but you need to do it from a Mac. Oh, from the Mac. Yeah, so mm -hmm. from Windows, you can do Android, HTML5, and Windows. For Mac, you can do mm -hmm. iOS and TV iOS, and from Linux, Linux. So, uh, okay. So did we? we so didn't really talk about lighting much. We didn't. Okay, so we talk about light today then. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So we. Okay. Let me just recap a little bit on the master material, just to see what we did. Okay, cool. Well, this will be a base. All right. Let's talk about lighting because light is very important. So, for example, this thing that is happening here, for me, is really annoying, uh, but it's very important. So, <clears throat> so, if you want to, okay, let's let's do really quick lighting. So, if you want to light a scene properly to get the best results, you need to bake the light. So, you you need to do a static lighting. For static lighting, you you have to do light maps. Right, so the whole unwrapping thing, all that boring part, if you want the best results, that is the mandatory step. You have to do your light modes. You can do it automatically. You can do them automatically, although they will be not very efficient, but at least you'll get something. If you, if you just want something that looks okay, you can have everything dynamic. So let's, let's talk very quickly about dynamic light, static light, and post-processing. So first of all, Let's just uh, go to, so everyone in the scene, in your scene, should have a, a directional light source. So if you see your light source, you select the light and you go to your details panel, you're going to see that you have this mobility section in your lights, which says static, stationary, and movable. I think we talked briefly about it, but I, I'll say it again. So if my light is movable, that means that I can... Uh, Sorry, I'm just going to put a floor on this building to visualize a little bit better um, uh, the shadows. And maybe we can walk a little bit. Just really, really quickly. So if my, if my light is movable, that means that in real time, I can, I can change the, the angle, the, la the intensity, the color, whatever I want. Uh, so that is fully dynamic, right? So my light is fully dynamic. I can change the color, can do whatever I want with it. I can change the intensity, obviously. So this is great. But it's very expensive because it's computing everything every well, as fast as, as it can, so every few milliseconds. And also, it's doing kind of a cheap type of computation. It's just it's not bouncing the light around. It's just doing is ray casting. So it's it's calculating the direction of the of the light, giving intensity where it hits, and when it doesn't hit, it doesn't change the intensity or the color and it's just uh, projecting the rays to calculate the shadow. So it's fairly low quality. So that is the movable light. The static light is exactly the opposite. So the static light, uh, until I hit build here, I won't see the results. So I will have to pre-compute the light to see the results. So it's, full, it's completely static. That, mean, that means that if I have my light, 
like this, I hit build, I calculate the shadows. If I move the light, the shadows will stay. So with uh, static lights is, is how you get the best lighting quality possible. And stationary, it is something in between. So I can, I have to pre-compute it. So I will pre-calculate the light, it will bounce on everything, but it's just, it, will, it will put the bake in a special texture that will allow me to change still the after baking, the intensity and the color of the light. So although this seems perfect, it is not, because I can only put three overlapping stationary lights at the same time, right? So if I get a point light and I make it stationary, and, uh, and then I make another one, and then I make another one, and they overlap, they touch each other. After baking, if there are more than three touching, it will give me an error. So stationary lights, I can only have three of them touching at the same time. So if I have a fourth one, after baking, I will get a cross, a red X on the light. That means that there is a problem there. One of those lights is not computing, so watch out. <coughs> I rarely use stationary lights, like almost never. I tend to do everything static as much as I can, and if I can't have uh, static lights, normally I just leave them movable as a, as a fill light. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's just leave it moving for now, and I'm gonna do it quite away again. So the uh, directional light is exactly the same as in any other software in the world. There's not much to explain there. The point light, same thing, is uh, like in all the softwares in the world. It's like an omni-light, omnidirectional, so it spreads the light in this sphere. I can change the, the source, and I can change the length to make kind of a tube light. So that's kind of interesting. I think, did we talk about uh, emissive lights the other day, making a material? No. No? Okay, I'll explain that because that's quite interesting. Um, so a point, a point light is really useful to make a light bulb, for example. Uh, but also, for example, I can do a neon light, like if it's a neon tube, because I can change the, the source to make this kind of a cylindrical light. Right? But if, for example, what I have is a, a neon text, if I have a, or a really strange shape, let's say that I make a light that has I don't know, this shape, for example, right? So I can just go here, make a tube out of, the, out of this, right? Something like that. Just make it a little bit less weird. So you can make anything, like pretty much anything any uh, type of geometry. Just, let's just export this, for example. So this is our neon light. So I'm gonna export it. Quick question. Yep. Did, would you never say like FBX files directly into your Unreal folders? No. No, 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 no. Because so if if you if any of you come from Unity, the FBX in Unity will stay as the source file. So you could when you when you import it, it still stays as the FBX file, right? Here everything is an Unreal asset. So the FBX is just a raw file. It will be just like putting weight on your project. This mm, here, so when when we import the file, the FBX, 
gets transformed into the unreal asset because the difference is that the unreal asset has the information of the FBX, which is what you're seeing here, but also has the information of the LODs, of the materials that have been applied, of the reduction that I made. So the, the best thing is to have kind of your export folder where you have all the source files, which you will see the, uh, the location here, right? So you're not losing them. You, you always know where it is. File path, it will tell you what it is, right? And then everything that is in the content browser, and the sorry, in the content folder, it is an unreal asset. So this is my project. You go to content, you go to meshes, and it's a U asset. The level is also a, well, the level is a U map, but the material is a U asset, the texture is a U asset. So yeah, never. So now if I import my neon, uh, sorry, I didn't convert it to a mesh, so I didn't export. Right, so, so I have this mesh. I have this mesh and let's say that I want to make a, a light out of this. So what I have to do is, um, well, first of all, fix this problem that someone was having the other day. Can you, maybe it would be good to repeat that because I think that's kind of something that will come up a lot of times. If you undo that, it said so. Preview or what it light map. There was yeah, there was an orange text in my mesh that was saying invalid light map resolution or something like that. I don't know exactly what it says. I don't know if I can go back. Um, let me see. And maybe you reinforce it. Yeah, well, well that, that should. I know it doesn't. Well, if you see an orange text in your mesh, it means that for the size of your mesh. That the default light map resolution is too small, right? So when you see that, you need to go to your static mesh and just change the light map resolution. Light map resolution. Right. <clears throat> to just double it or triple it, 256. I think 256 is a decent number for, for any object. So, <clears throat> so yeah, sorry. Let's say that we want to make a light out of anything. A light that actually emits light. And when I calculate the light, it's gonna bounce around and it's gonna act at, as a real light. Well, first of all, I would need uh, geometry. So in this, ex this case, I've just made this um, really quick neon tube. And then the other thing that we would need is a a material that is going to simulate that is light. So in this case, I'm not going to use the master material. I'm just going to show you how to do a really, really easy emissive material that would be controlled as a light. So I think this is a good one to keep. So maybe you want to follow along because if you do it now, you can just mm -hmm. copy paste it forever. So if we go to our materials folder and we do a new asset and we call it, for example, M underscore master uh, emissive. I don't know if I wrote this correctly. Is it two M's? Two S. Two S. Ah. Cool. So then, <clears throat> this material is really simple. Although because it's reusable, let's try to do it right. So let's make a parameter for the color. So you remember number three and click and you get a, a vector three. So vector three, then right click, convert to parameter and let's call this emissive color in the group uh, diffuse. Mm. 
Then, so it's going to be really, really simple. Then I'm going to make a, a multiplier that is going to act as the intensity. So number one and click to get a, an, a float and then right click convert to parameter and I'm going to call this emissive multiplier, uh, oh, intensity. Let's call this intensity. Let's keep it simple. So with the number three and click, I get a vector three or right click and you can type uh, vector parameter. Sorry, maybe I didn't explain the other day as well, but if you right click and you get the menu, you can make a parameter directly. You could just type vector parameter and it will create a node that is already a parameter. So you just need to fill in the details. I'm, I just, it's, it's, it's the same. So I have a vector for my color and I have an intensity. So now I'm gonna multiply those. So right click and type multiply. So if we multiply the color for by the intensity, yep. Get the multiply is told in M, right? Yes. Or just I think it might it might be simpler to remember if you just right click and type whatever you want to do. Right? Multiply. So also remember that this palette here has all the commands. So I could also type multiply here. There are like many ways of getting this getting the same thing. So you also have filters here, but anyway. So I'm going to put as a default value uh, 1, right? So really simple. I'm just going to link this to my base color and to my emissive color. Right? So there are really there are two ways of doing this, and I'm going to explain both. Uh, if you want to keep the color, let's say pure, you can only link the color to the base color and the multiplication by the intensity to the emissive, or you can link both. So this will give more intensity to the color. So you can experiment with those two options. I think we keep if we keep it like that. you will get let, less intensity on the base color, but since it's gonna be a light, it's gonna be so strong that I don't think you'll notice the difference anyway. But let's just uh, compile it and make an make a, um, instance to see how this behaves. So now I have my instance. I'm gonna uh, I sa assign this instance to the neon tube. So now let's make a like a nice blue, right? So right now this is not very in intense, right? <laughs> but if I start increasing, you're gonna see that it starts glowing. So this becomes a light. So if I put this inside of this dark uh, environment that we have inside of that room, maybe if I minus the bit inside, we'll see it glowing, right? So this is a this is right now this is only an effect. This is not emitting light. This is just changing the value of the pixels of my screen, but it's not bouncing light around. For this thing to become a light, an actual light, I need to do one step more. I need to select my geometry, my neon tube. This is important. So I select the neon tube. I go to the details panel and I think the, the easiest thing would be to type what you're looking for but just so you know where you are go to the lighting se section on your mesh and you go to the light mask settings maybe I should take a screenshot of this right and say use emissive for a static lighting if you activate this Basically, you're, what you're saying is, take this geometry, 
And if this geometry has an emissive material, take into account the intensity of this emissive material and treat the vertex as if they were lights. So this is not a cheap operation, but since we are pre-computing, it doesn't matter, right? It just take a little bit longer. But basically, activating use emissive for static lighting, I've transformed this or, or anything that I do in the same manner, I'm just gonna make it a little bit smaller, into a uh, light. So when I bake the light with Bill, this will bounce around as if it was a, a normal light. I just want you to understand the difference between what we are seeing right now, which is just an effect, just a, let's call it a post-process effect that I can change in real time, and this thing becoming a light. So when we bake the light, this is gonna start bouncing, so it's gonna give me a really nice uh, soft effect. So, this would be the way of making absolutely any shape into a light. So a light bulb can be done this way, a neon tube can be done this way, or something like this. Cool? Questions? No? Cool. Let's move on then. So you can keep your master uh, neon or master emissive light and do anything with it. The cool thing, we did a master, so remember, now if I duplicate this guy, I can just change the color of this one, and I have a completely different uh, neon light with another uh, intensity, right? So, Which is really so cool. it was just clicking that, like, uh, use emissive for a static light? That is, so we've done three things here, important. The master emissive that you can use for anything. Then the um, uh, making the effect, right, which is this, and then ticking it use emissive for static lighting is converting the geometry into a light. So if you don't tick that, it won't be a light. It just will be an effect. But we are ticking that on the material. No, on you're the, ticking it on the mesh. Okay. So you say on the mesh. So for example, right now, this, this thing that I just applied, this pink geometry is not a light yet. Until I go here in the lighting section and I say use emissive for static lighting. And you have the mesh selected. I have the mesh Not selected. The, okay. So, because the, it, it is per mesh. Okay. Right. So it's saying, use the emissive of my material for the static layer. So, yeah, and the cool thing of the master materials is that yeah, I can control individually, right? So this is, this is really cool. Uh, watch out with the intensity, because the intensity as an effect it might look right, but as a light, it might be a lot more. So you're gonna have to do trial and error here. That's why I'm gonna explain the light, uh, spotlight, so you understand all the lights, and then we're gonna talk about the double post process before getting into um, into parameters, because uh, when I light, I'll, show you, I'll, I'll explain my process, and I think you'll understand why. So the last type of, what? Well, no, sorry, not the last type of light, the, uh, the last type of normal light is the uh, spotlight. Spot, sorry, did we, we didn't talk about lights at all the other day? So I didn't talk about skylights? Okay, then I'll explain, sorry. Maybe I'm just confused with another group. So, okay, so directional light, it is, uh, like in any other software in the world, the ones that you would use mainly to simulate the sun because it has the rays parallel, right? So we simulate that this, this light source is in the infinite. So that's why we can have parallel rays. Point light is like an omnidirectional light, like spread, spread light in every direction. So it's the, so we put it there. It is a sphere, right? Let's just bring it. So, uh, yeah, point light spreads light into uh, every direction. So, spotlight would be like a, um, maybe like a reading light with a lampshade. So, it has a cone shape. Uh, 
So this could be used for yeah, lamps and with light bulbs as well. So here, same, is like in any other software, there's nothing special about it. You just change the angle and the, uh, the length. Uh, so all those lights behave in the same way. They can be static, stationary, or movable. Normally, if you have one static, you, you should have all of them static. So for your top quality renders, I recommend that you do everything static. For your tests, I recommend uh, doing movable. So in movable, you're gonna see everything in real time. In study, you will have to wait until you build, but we'll talk about that. Let's just explain the lights. Uh, the skylight, it is a special type of light. So right now in my scene, I do have a skylight. So let's see how does this, I'm gonna remove the spotlight and the point lights. And let's see how this scene looks without the skylight. So it looks pretty black. So the skylight is a cheap way of dynamically simulating uh, light bounds from the sky. So what this is thing, what this light is doing is when I put this, you see the difference. This is like, let's say, one bounce from the sky. So it's making an invisible dome. A fake dome around an invisible around my um, scene, and it is making. You see that here when I select my skylight, it says capture scene. Basically, what it's doing is it's making a 360 render that I don't see. It's making a 360 render of my scene and bouncing back the light, the colors that is getting from that 360 render. So. To understand this, I can explain really uh, quickly. Do you remember, did we, we did make a, a fake, sorry. Uh, did we make a fake reflection in our master material? No, no? okay, cool. So, if you go to modes and you type, uh, Scene. There are two types of special cameras: the scene capture 2D and the scene capture Q. If you select a scene capture Q and you drop it into the scene, this is a special type of camera that can make a 360 render in real time. But this is really expensive. We would never use this to render a movie. We would use this to for example, fake reflections on a material. So how does this work? The camera needs a texture target. So this camera needs a file that can write to, so it can save that 360 render in real time. So this is a special type of file, which is a render texture target. So how do you create a render texture target? So you can right click, go to new asset at all, as always, and go to materials and textures. And we would do a Q render target. The good thing about those difficult and strange things that you may or may not remember, if, it's, if I make the wrong one, I, would, I won't be able to put it here. So just give me an error. So you can, if you don't remember whether it was a texture target or a media texture or a cube render target, you just try until you find the right one. So a, a texture render target, I could name it, but I'm just gonna leave it like that. Right now it's green because it's empty, there is nothing into it. But as soon as I put it here, this is gonna be filled with a 360 render of my scene. So if I put it there, you see? Now I just got an instant 360 render. So I'm gonna open it so you see what I'm seeing. And now you're I want you to see how this thing is gonna update. So, right, as I move it, it keeps making in real time my 360 render. So, okay, cool. So now I have a cool image that I can reuse to do a few things with it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it 
explain the thing, leave it there, and then we'll go back into it. Just be very careful about a couple of things. The default size of this texture, it is 256 pixels. For what we are doing, this is a lot, so be very careful. Uh, because this is really expensive, but what we can do is we can make it less expensive. So remember, this is the render texture, the cube render target, right? And we made it with a scene capture cube. So I'm going to take a screenshot of this, a scene capture cube, right? Which is this little camera on the scene. So there is a really important thing. Just as soon as you put your scene capture cube on the scene, go to the details panel and deactivate capture every frame. Because otherwise, this is making a 360 render every frame. That's super expensive. But if I deactivate it... So untick capture untick. every frame from the, this cube camera. If I untick that, it will only update if I move the camera, which is great, because normally you put it in place I will and you'll never update it again. You can put many of them and not update them, and that's it. So this is really important if you use it. But anyway, what I was trying to, although we're going to come back to this, what I wanted to explain is that the skylight is making one of those. You don't see it, but it's making one of those of my scene, and then it's feeding back the colors. So I get this nice bounce light from, from the sky. So pretty much that's how the skylight works, unless, which is really important, unless I decide to specify a cube map. This is great because I could say, I really, really want to simulate how the sky in this square is in January. So I could come in January, make it a HDRI 360 image of reality and feed those colors back. So with the skylight, I have the option of capturing the scene, whatever is surrounding me, or do image-based lighting as in any other software in the world, which is key to photorealism. So I'm not gonna get into super detail into this, into this but I just explained the concept. So if you type image-based light or lighting, uh, in V-Ray or in any other software, you're going to see those things, right? You're going to see Chrome balls and HDRIs. So, IBL for short. So, if you want to, if, you're, if your aim is photorealism, this will be important, IBL lighting. So, what do I need to do image-based lighting, which is the, the most realistic thing that you you can do well. The first thing that you need is an HDR panorama of the real environment that you want. So you can go to many websites and download them for free, or buy, or just find wherever. So an HDR looks like this: it's the 360 panorama uh, of, but they are they are high dynamic range. That means if you are into photography, that uh, it's been taken with lots of uh, stops, so you get exposure from very low to very high. So if you get your HDR. Uh, you could, you can import it here as a regular texture, just just an HDR, but you can import it as a regular texture. And then when you decide to specify the cube map, you just feed it here, right? Uh, and Real has a few by default, so <clears throat> just so you know, uh, if you go to here to view options, you can click show engine content and you'll get a lot of, a lot of folders with useful content like for example uh, HDR images that would be well somewhere uh, since you're already showing the engine content when you come here it's gonna give you the options of that hidden content so for example I'm gonna choose this desert outer HDR right so this will be an HDR image or this anyway <coughs> If I choose this as my HDR, instead of having this all blue, very clear uh, bounce light, when I bake, I'm gonna get those orangey colors 
right, of this environment. So those will be the two cases of um, lighting with the skylight, either specifying the cube map or capturing the scene. In any case, this will only work as a static. This will only work when you bake. If your skylight is dynamic, <clears throat> it will always have to be uh, this. So, again, I recommend you use your skylight as static. <clears throat> is this kind of clear or was it a bit confusing? Any question there? No? Uh, is it possible to change the sky to something else? This sky? Yeah. Well, actually, yes. The <clears throat> if if um okay, let's see if we can download one and we do the whole okay, let's see if I can get this. Do I need to register? Yeah, you have to go to check out. Uh um, I might even, let's see if I'm lucky. Well, I suppose no one has an HDR handy, no? Mm -hmm. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to take this one or um, okay, let's take this one. I'm going to export it as if it was. So basically, if you download an HDR from internet, normally what you need to do is you just import the HDR, so image.hdr as a high dynamic range to use it for image-based lighting, but then you're gonna also, so that's actually a good question, you're gonna also take your HDR, go into Photoshop, and just save it as a regular texture, as a TGA, so you can actually use it. So obviously it's, uh, now it's probably a 32-bit, so you're gonna have to go image mode and change it to eight or 16-bit, Otherwise, you won't be able to uh, save it as a regular TGA. Um, so, if you see here, this is what an HDR has. It has all the information from the very low exposure to the very high, without losing any information. Right? If you do this with a JPEG, this would be black. Right? Anyway, let's do it like that. So now I go save as. This one is obviously very low resolution, but I think for this example, it's fine. So, what what we would have to do is, uh, in our 3D package, we would have to make a sphere with the normals inverted. So I could uh, put my HDR image as a background and make the actual light and the environment uh, much. So if I have my HDR, sorry, I put the wrong one. Sorry, you're just doing that right here. Sorry, I'm doing a. Uh, I've taken the HDR as an image. It's not yet, but I get it back in here. You just. Uh, oh, yeah, I, this is just to visualize it. So this is step oh. you wouldn't. It's not really necessary. I just want you to visualize what's going on with the normals. So if I wanted to use my HDR, I would have to have a sphere that has the faces looking inwards. So when I'm inside of the sphere, I can actually see what's going on. So if I make, do you remember what we were talking about the other day about the normals having, so the normal of a plane being only on one side, like pointing outwards, and when I look to this side I don't see, right? So you remember that that if I make so in in, in 3D, in any 3D software, the plane has only one face. Right? That's clear, right? 
So if I apply this material, I see it from the face that the normal is pointing outward, out, outwards, but the other side I don't see, right? This is clear for everyone, mm -hmm. right? So the same happens to the sphere. If I want you to use this sphere as my sky, if I'm inside of the sphere, I don't see it. So what I need to do, sorry, what I need to do is to first apply my material, and then in 3D Max is really easy that we have a normal modifier that allow me to allows me to flip the normals. So then I'll see the sky when I'm inside. Right? So this would be my sky uh, my sky sphere. I would probably make it fairly big before exporting so I don't have to scale it up in Unreal. So so I would just export that, there's nothing else that I need to do. So it's just just a sphere with the normals inverted. So I would go Explore, selected, I could call this uh, sky sphere or something like that. And then I could come here to my meshes. So that's my sphere, and now obviously I would have to import my texture, the the regular TGA that I, that I made in Photoshop from my HDR, and I could just really quickly create a material and apply it, and I would have there my new sky, right? Would the sky can move? This sky, well, it's just an image. I mean, you could rotate it, <laughs> you could fake a little bit of movement, but you could have different layers. You could have several spheres, or you could you could have volumetric clouds. I mean, this is just to do a simple. Uh, Can you have moving textures? Sorry. Can you have animated textures? That would be expect. You could, but you would have to find uh, animated HDR. That would be. But in general. You can. Yeah, yeah, like you can, of course. You can simulate with animated texture. Sorry, the what? It's like water, but it's still simulated with animated texture. Or well, what water is complicated? In it depends on the engine. So if in like AAA games, the water is simulated, so it's actually flowing. Um, and then there are flow maps, which yes, there are kind of animated textures. There, water is tricky. Yeah. But here, there will be a million ways of uh, making the, I mean, this obviously was really low res, but um, we could have different layers. But yeah, it's just to explain really uh, quickly that there are options. The, uh, the cool thing about this is that your sky matches with your HDR. So although the cloud will be static, the I think the, the effect for images and videos would be more than enough. For a real time, it would be maybe not so great. But that would be the process, right? Um, any question? No? Was it clear? How do you do a sky? Cool. So, so again, the skylight, the skylight is, I would say is mandatory. So if in a normal light setup, you're gonna have uh, at least a skylight. I think it's the only light that is mandatory because you could, you could light an entire scene only with a skylight and an HDR. So that would be pretty realistic for an exterior at least. Uh, for example, there is this guy, uh, which uses a lot of HDR uh, in Unreal, that has amazing scenes, lit only with an HDR. It's not very fast, this, right? Okay.
So this thing, for example, well, it has like some um, some other light sources, but the exterior is mainly lit with uh, HDRs. You see, like how rich and soft is the light. So it's a really good option. So if there's if there is a light. For re I'm talking always realistic lighting. Um, skylight will be the most important one. Static, again, obviously. And then there is a, a very useful type of light, which is more a helper than a light. So when you go to modes and you go to the light, sh light section, you get directional point spot skylight. But there is another type of light, which is the light portal. It's not really a light. A light mask portal is more like a helper. So how does this work? Well, first of all, uh, well, I'm going to put one, and let me let me explain a couple of things. So light mask, it is the uh, software inside of Unreal that calculates the light. <clears throat> so there are a few things that are called light mass, whatever. So light map is what renders the light, what calculates the light. So a, a light mass portal, it is, it is a helper that you can scale, is always gonna be kind of a plane. It looks like a volume, but it's more like a plane. So that's why you'll be able to scale it in a couple of axes, but ne never in depth. It will always back to its original depth. So this portal, you should put it in all the openings of your building. So what, what this is going to do is going to help you to concentrate the, uh, let's, let's say, the calculations. So this will help to not waste time, basically. It will concentrate the light calculation. It will give you better quality in less time. So, for example, in this building, I would, uh, I would sort of put in light mass portals in all my openings. So I will take this one and scale it, place it there. You can put it roughly, it doesn't have to be very, very tight or anything. It's just, again, it's just a helper. So I could put one here, kind of covering that opening. so on. I would put more here, but basically in every opening. And you don't have to, do, once they're placed, they're placed. At the right scale, at the right size, you don't really have to do anything with them. Just place them whatever you consider that are going to help you concentrate the light calculation. Because there is no point making an effort here on the light calculation when it's, it's just a wall, right? You just want more light to enter through those through those openings. So, as for types of lights, those are the, the different type of lights. But now there are some, some of the things that we need to take into account. There is, an, there is a volume, so in Unreal, I don't know if you've been working with volumes already, there are another type of helpers that are volumes. There are loads of volumes. So if you go to the modes, you go to the volume section, you have all those volumes. So we have for us, there are two that are really important. Uh, and yeah, we're not really gonna talk about the rest. Our two most important volumes are the, first of all, the light mass importance volume. So this is mandatory in area scene. You need at least one light mass importance volume. So what this is going to do is, is again, this is going to help us to calculate more and faster. So this volume needs to be, needs to be around the, the whole building or the most important part of the building. And everything that is within that volume will be calculated faster and at better, and at better quality. So you can just uh, scale up the volume 
or just so you know how it works the volumes can be edited as geometry so if I made this volume <coughs> I'm in the first icon right if I go to the last icon I'm in the let's say edit mode so now I can select for example a face and just pull it this is just like more general knowledge than anything else this is you can just scale the volume but if you know how volumes how to edit volumes just in case you have a weird shape uh, you can do it this way so I could for example go to top view and select specific vertices vertex or or right whoops God's sake. Just gonna do it this way. I'm just trying to cover the whole building. <coughs> and now, if I want to get out of the edit mode, I just come here, and now it becomes a normal object. So let's see if I manage to cover the whole thing. Okay, that seems okay. So the light mass importance volume, the tighter the better because it will be faster and you will get more, more quality with less time. How does that work? Sorry? How does it work that it just speeds up the quality of the light? Well, you're telling the engine to concentrate the lighting calculations only in this volume. Otherwise, it's trying to calculate for like almost infinite scene. Because there are no, you're not defining the boundaries here, right? So if I define a volume and all the lighting calculations are concentrated in this volume, it will take a lot less. Obviously. Does it, does it try to calculate light even if there are no objects to show light on? Well, the light bounces. So if one ray comes here, bounces here, it will bounce back until it loses energy, and the the energy gets lost, get lost with the square root of the distance, right? Okay. But if I have a ceiling and it hits the ceiling, it won't keep going further. Although it still has energy to go further. But I'm telling, well, don't bother because this is as high as my ceiling goes. <clears throat> Since we're talking about saving, uh, I just take a screenshot so you can do this. You only have to do this once per project, but um, this is relevant. So let's go to edit, edit or preferences. So I'm gonna take a screenshot. Experimental. And at the bottom, in lighting builds we should activate enable multi-thread light map encoding and enable, enable multi-thread shadow map encoding because this is going to speed up enormously your light map encoding and shadow map encoding when you have a little scene that doesn't matter but when you have a huge scene this can save you like an hour or a couple of hours so just activate it it's experimental but it works i always use it and just, that's it. You activate it and you don't have to worry. It will just use all the cores in your computer to do the encoding, which is important. <laughs> so again, editor preferences, exper general experimental lighting builds. Do we have to do this every time you open it? And in every new project, yes. Which you should only have really one project for the whole semester. Right? Just your project, just work on that project. It is, I mean, you'll thank me. It is good, just activate it. <coughs> cool. So, there is another really important volume, and now, after I explain this volume, then I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna explain my process and why I do that like that. So the light mass importance volume will help you to do faster lighting. So 
you need at least one per scene, but you can have more, and you can also daisy chain them. So you, I can define several important areas in my scene. So you can have as many light mass importance volumes as you want. Just don't overdo it. I think the best is just do one. Um, especially for in VR that we might move around and look everywhere, you, you want kind of the same uh, detail in the light everywhere because you can look anywhere. So our other really important volume would be the uh, post-process volume. So this is going to take us a little bit of uh, time to explain. So in real time, obviously, the post-process happens in real time. This is a very expensive operation. Um, so that's why, the, that's why the volume will try to pile up a lot of operations. So uh, we're going to explain a couple of them, and then maybe we'll go more into detail, maybe not. But how does this work? So basically, the post-process volume, we can use it in two ways. We could use one volume for the whole scene, so then it wouldn't really matter where the volume is. So if I put a volume in my scene and I go to the details panel, the, the first and most important uh, thing to check is in the post-processing volume settings, this section, which says unbound. So if the volume is unbound, it will affect the whole scene. So it wouldn't matter whether I'm inside or outside of the volume, it will just affect everything. So I'm gonna check it and show you the um, an example. So for example, if I go to something extreme like um, white balance and I change the temperature to this, I have a post a post process volume that is affecting everything. Okay, if I make it unbound. Sorry, if I make it bound, what it means is I need to be inside of the volume to see the effect of the volume. Okay? This is cool because I can have a volume for the exterior and a volume for the interior or a volume per room and I can change the whole scene just by entering or exiting the volume. Right? So this is extremely useful. So, for now, uh, I'm going to make it, well, let me explain this first. You see that how from here, the interior, this interior looks pretty dark. But when I get inside, if I wait a little bit, this is starting to get brighter, right? This is because we have the exposure settings to be dynamic. So the post-process volume works in the same way. And I personally don't like dynamic exposure. And that's why I wanted to explain uh, the post-process volumes. It, the post-process volume controls a lot of stuff, but one of the most important ones, in my opinion, is this one, is the auto exposure. So right now, again, when I enter, the auto exposure is going to try to adapt my eyes, like, right, like, I, like my eyes do in real life, to a darker scenario, and it's going to increase the exposure so I can actually see something. But then if I go, if I go out to a brighter environment, it will uh, darken so this is not completely white or completely overblown. This is extremely important. <clears throat> if you go to the lead tab here, you're gonna see that all the way to the bottom, I can manually control the exposure of the scene. Right now it's in automatic, but let's just put it in zero, fixed <coughs> at zero and see what happens. So the exterior is a lot brighter and the interior as well, but now we're not changing. It's just a fixed amount which I particularly prefer, and I'll, I'll show you why. But 
the good thing is that you can test any exposure. So I can say plus 16, minus 16. I just, I'm just testing, right? I'm just changing it in my viewport. When, I, when we talk about high dynamic range, we're talking about an image that has all those values. So the image will have them all and we'll be able to control them. So this, this, is, an H, this is what HDR means. So, how do I light a scene? I don't like, I don't like uh, automatic exposure control, especially for virtual reality, because it's extremely annoying to get flashes of white and flashes of dark. So, my way of lighting a scene is fixing, from the beginning of the project, the exposure to zero or close to zero, and then light accordingly. If, if I'm lighting an interior and there is not enough light, then I just put more lights. I'm not relying on the auto exposure to have a correct uh, lighting. So how can you do that? Because this exposure is only changing uh, the viewport. If I build my project, those values don't affect. So normally what you should do is the exposure, leave it in automatic, and then <clears throat> in your post-process volume, go to the auto exposure section, I'll take a screenshot of this, and say, activate the min and mat max brightness, put those values to one, so the, min, the minimum is one, the maximum is also one, and then what we'll do is we'll play around with the exposure bias. So the bias between the values is what will give us the, this fixed exposure value. So basically this will work in the same way as this, but it will be fixed. So I, this is one of the first things that I do when I'm lighting a scene. I go to the post-process volume and put minimum and my maximum brightness to one, and then I, I'll control the exposure bias, which normally I'll stay, I'll stay at zero. So this would be my uh, default exposure. So if I go to whoops. there, you go. So I mean, I'm, I'm bound now. So if I am at zero, one, two, three. So I'll test, but normally I load at zero. So I have this really. Make those neon lights a little bit less intense, just to be a little bit uncomfortable. Just gonna leave them like that for now. So now that I'm not seeing changes in my exposure. Now I, I can evaluate and say, well, this, this interior seems a little bit uh, dark. But the truth is that right now, my lights are dynamic. I didn't calculate yet to see how this light is gonna bounce around. So how do we, how do, we do this? So we've set up our lights, we have our skylight, we have our light portals, we have the light mass importance volume. So now, how do we get top quality lighting here? Well, we need to go to the world settings. If you don't have this tab here, you have to go to window, world settings. In the world settings, you have a light mass section, and then you have the light mass settings. So those first four parameters are gonna control the quality of your scene, the quality of your light, sorry. So only those four parameters. You really don't have to worry much about anything else for now. 
one one thing that I always do, I don't know if I, I said this the other day, but I don't like to compress the light maps. So I always antique compress light maps. So this, if you leave uh, the mouse here, it will give you a tooltip that says that if you don't uncompress the light maps, the memory will increase by four, which is fine because you should have enough memory unless your scene is absolutely huge. But you will get a lot, a lot better quality if the light maps are uncompressed. If you beg your scene and you see it's too heavy, maybe you can compress them. But by default, I wouldn't compress the light maps. I think it's you get like a lot, a lot better quality. So then, apart from this, the important parameters are the static lighting level scale, the number of indirect lighting bounces, the indirect lighting quality, and the indirect lighting smoothness. So the static lighting level scale, basically, so it comes as one by default, and when you do a test, this should be one. You need to imagine if that so basically this thing what it's doing is the smaller the number, the better the quality because it will concentrate the light calculation in smaller areas. So a value of one, says the tooltip, imagines that one unit is one unreal centimeter, which is how it is. If you reduce this value, it will, it will reduce the unit size, so it will be able to calculate more like intricate detailed shadows. Like just smaller details. If you increase the number, the render times will be faster, but it, will, it won't take into account such a small object. So for example, if your project is, is a terrain of like, I don't know, 20 kilometers, you should increase this value. But if your project is just normal architecture, normal size, a building like this, you should reduce, the, reduce this value to get better quality. In my good quality renders, I go to the minimum always, which is 0.1, but this takes a lot, a lot, a lot longer. Uh, so I would say for a test, one, for a final quality render, 0.1 or 0.2. 0.1 will be the best value, but it will take a lot longer. The second important parameter is the number of indirect lighting, lighting bounces. So if I put this to one, I have uh, my light, it will throw a ray, bounce here once, and then it will get lost when it loses uh, energy. If I have two bounces, it will come here, bounce once, go there, bounce again, and lose its energy. So here what it's saying is, the first bounce takes a lot of time to calculate, and from the second one onwards, every bounce would take less. So from the third or fourth, they are almost free, but also they don't affect that much, really. I tend to put this value really high because it, it all, up from the second one, it almost doesn't affect render time. So for a test, I would say put one bounce for a, a quality render, put 100. In 418, you will have another uh, bounce parameter here. So 418, which is the one that you'll be using soon, if you are not using already, there is also the number of bounces of the skylight. So that one um, affects a little bit more render time, so maybe be more careful with that one. Maybe you can go between 5 and 10, maybe 20 at maximum. For the skylight bounces. bounces. So that one, it, yeah that one is, it will, it will affect more the render times. And then we have the indirect lighting quality. So this is, this is really simple. This is a multiplier. Quality of one, uh, it will give you standard quality. Two, two times more quality and two, two times render time, three, three times. So it's literally a multiplier. For, for a test, I would do one, quality one, and for a final quality, I would do quality 10, which is the maximum. And then this value, uh, the indirect lighting smoothness, so the higher the quality, if you understand, well, I don't want to get into detail, but the 
so if you imagine that this is more dense well the photo mapping calculation basically what it does is it puts samples on surfaces so it calculates the pixels around every sample and kind of average the colors so it gives you this soft smooth light so the higher the quality the uh, the more samples you get so there is when you increase the quality a lot you reach a point where there are so many samples that you get you you see it, it's not able to average the color so well as when you have less samples so you get artifacts what they are called artifacts so it can start looking worse than a worse quality render so this value here what it's doing is trying to smooth out smooth out those samples so you don't get those artifacts so they are saying so you read the tooltip what it's saying is if you increase the value you can blur out you lose a little bit of quality but you can even those colors so you don't get those artifacts so this number if you do a really high quality render and you see that you, you get a kind of a strange dark areas or colors that are not really matching really well you can increase this value a little bit i however tend to do the opposite i lower it because i still have an encounter i've encountered those, those problems but i prefer accurate lightning if i get even if i get a um artifact here and there i don't think they are so horrible unless you get like a whole world full, full of artifacts if i get one artifact in one place but everything is super high quality i can't live with that so i normally i go between 0.9 and 1.1 here but you, you just need to test you need to start with one if you get something strange you need to know that if you go above one you are blurring the uh, the values of the of the uh, light if you go below you're sharpening so if you sharpen as well you get more detail so i wouldn't be very extreme like 0 0.1 0 0.9 1 1.1 <clears throat> and everything else really you shouldn't worry too much about it i think with those values you should be fine but the thing is then here when you go to the build quality there is a drop down and you have the lighting quality presets so obviously preview you'll select to make uh, test renders so basically those light presets will take those values into account and multiply and change according to to the preset so preview for a really quick render medium you'll start getting pretty decent quality and it takes longer. High is for a final quality render and production, you are gonna rarely see the difference between high and production. So production, you probably will do once, just the very last time before you build your project. I tend to go uh, between medium and high, but we, we have our, um, we put five computers to calculate the projects in the office. So here you could put all the computers on a farm and render a lot faster. So again, between those four values here and the light preset, you should be able to get a, uh, all the light uh, parameters that you need, because then you can go to the INI files on the engine. I'm gonna just show this out of curiosity. You shouldn't, you don't really have to do this, but just so you know, if you go to your program files, Epic Games, and uh, engine folder, and you go to the config files, you have a base light mass. Sorry, let me just. Um, file name extension. So you have this base lightmass.ini file that if you edit the file you could increase even more the uh, 
the parameters and the light quality. So, for example, I have here uh, the, if I go down, dev option static lighting production quality. So those are the parameters that will be multiplied by those parameters, right, to, to get the final values for my renders. I could start increasing those values if you know what they're doing. If you are really, really skilled in V-Ray or other renderer and you understand what those things mean, you can change those values and get even faster renders and more quality. But if, you, if you're not, just don't touch them because they are more than enough for what you need. This is only for like super advanced uh, light quality renders. You shouldn't really touch this, but out of curiosity, you should know that it exists and you can change them. Okay. Right, so just to recap, to get super quality, what you need is those values, the presets, you need your lights, and you need the you need proper light maps and proper light map size. So, for example, this piece actually did we this piece doesn't even have a light map uh, doesn't even have a light map channel. Ah, uh, well, right. It's not great. Didn't we do a light map the other day of one of the Only pieces? Only for one. Only for one? Oh, Was it? Yeah. Well, so you need the UV channel for every piece. Right, and you need to set the proper or the correct light map resolution for top quality, right? So, if we want to do a quick render of this, we would have to re export those pieces. Let's see if we did it for this one here. Oh, yeah, so this one has the, the correct light map, this one does not. So, maybe let's see. Would we get anything if we do that? Maybe just uh, for the example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save, make a copy and delete those two pieces and make a render. Uh, shouldn't take very long. Maybe we can take some questions. Just duplicate. And So those pieces have light maps, so I should be able to bake it nicely. So let's speak. Let's just go right. I'm just gonna really quickly make a Just want this to bake simple. Okay, let's see if I can just really quickly bake. Uh, I'm gonna do it in preview, see if it doesn't take very long. Just so we see the, the difference of the light bouncing and not bouncing. So 
So first of all, let's make our light static. Right. Let's get put in the capture scene. Let's make sure I have proper. So I'm gonna put 0 0.5 there, 10 to just for a quick test. You see that now before I bake all my well first of all it's telling me my in my shadow is telling me it's a preview and my shadow is quite black. So skylights light source I have the light mass importance volume I also have the light mass portals I'm gonna make in preview and see what I get. So when I'm ready when everything is ready to bake if I've never baked before, it, it will give you a message. So the lining needs to be rebuilt. So I just need to build. And now, you're going to get this icon here. If you double click it, you're going to get the swarm agent. So this is the light mass. This is the software inside of our engine that is calculated. So if you zoom in, you're going to see what's going on. So it's emitting the photons that we were talking about here. Now it's collecting the photons, then it's going to process the mapping. So that's, those are the two things that we activated in the experimental. So the pro this processing, when it starts becoming blue, this processing will be faster because we activated as an experimental feature. And then you just get the lights. Shouldn't take super long because we only have a couple of objects. But Where did you click to get this form agent? It is this icon here. Oh, yeah, okay. So you just double click and you so get outside it. Outside of Unreal, just yeah. in the Windows tab. <clears throat> also, if you see that something might be going wrong, you can go to the log and read what's going on. So it gives you quite a lot of interesting information there. Uh, but yeah, maybe it is too in depth. So maybe we can take some questions while this bakes. Should be more than a couple of minutes. Maybe I will just do a little recap with them but maybe on what we'll go on mm -hmm. to also because you will all be at the jury which is coming up fairly soon they will be mm -hmm. um, showing the simulation live uh -huh. to jurors cool. so the things that we should look through we spoke about sequencer yeah so we'll we look into that look now. now at how to record like an animation like putting a camera pad um, but also, how we should also look a little bit on how to like how to build layer start, ah, how yeah, yeah. to basic uh, to package the project, mm -hmm. and so that it plays in full um, scale, so it doesn't create a small window, and yeah. uh, um, so that you all know how to just at a jury or whatever, just double click, and it's already mm -hmm. loading, and everything is working. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, maybe we can talk about that while this... Uh, so there's a good thing about uh, baking the light is this is, is an asynchronous process, so you can keep working on your scene and do whatever you want. There's as no light with you, right? Move any geometries, right? As long as... Yeah, well, you, you can move it, but you'll break it. I mean, you can keep working while it calculates, but yeah, if you move it, when you finish, it will be in the wrong place. But you can keep working on the materials, do stuff on the engine. So you can keep working. It's not like with v that you hit render and you need to wait and don't do anything else. This is different. So uh, let's start by so building a project is normally really simple if you understand what's going on. Since I assume most of you don't understand what's going on, it's quite possible that you will you won't be able to build the project. But that's not the end of the world because you can still launch the project as a standalone. So if, you, if it's the day of the project, you should try to build it. And you should, yeah, if you can't do it, just look up a tutorial. It's not that difficult, but sometimes there are problems, there are files that are corrupting the build. If it's the day of the jury and you actually, you didn't manage to build it, when you go here in play, there is a drop down, and you can launch the game in a standalone. Did you, so, did you all get that? This is kind of important. This is, this is very important. So when you build the project, you go to File, Package Project, and you get an executable file. But if you don't manage to build the project, and you don't want to show the project in the engine, obviously in a jury, you shouldn't, 
you can go to this tab here and in the drop down you can go to play in a standalone and basically this will launch the game uh, in a separated window then you will be able to minimize your project and you just get uh, the game as if it was built. It's not exactly the same but at least you won't see the editor right so basically here nothing's up I know it is happening oh, yeah, I can walk yeah so uh, if I manage to get my I can maximize it so the tilde key just so you know guys which key? the tilde key this one here brings the console so the console is really useful for many things I might explain just a couple of useful yeah. ones but for example is useful sometimes just to get control of the mouse. Sorry? That's not the. So now you are. So when you bring up the console command, you can't really move. So you, you when you. So when you, if you hit once, you get the little console. If you get hit twice, you get the big console. So. The console, what allows you is to do, well, to send commands directly to the, to the game. So for example, a useful command, let's say that you are, let's put us in the worst case. You did everything wrong and it's the day of the presentation and you get this ugly message and you didn't manage to build it. Well, we could type, just read here, disable all screen messages. So if I hit the console command and I type this disable, you see when I start typing something that is correct, it will give me the, the tip. So disable all screen messages. If I hit enter, now I don't have the ugly message anymore, which is bad, right? Because I don't know what's wrong, but at least I don't see it. Now, if I want it again, I can just type enable all screen messages and I get it back. So that's what the console is used for. But also sometimes, just because you need to get control of the mouse, you just do that. Did you also maximize the window using console? Yes, yeah, so what I did, because it started like that, and I, and I was playing, and I couldn't maximize, so just hit the console command, and just maximize the window. Although, although, we'll... Uh, I think we could just type full screen, right? So now we're full, full screen. So that's also useful in the console command, right? So I type full screen and I don't even have the Windows bar anymore, which is nice for a presentation, right? Also, sometimes the project gets completely stuck and hitting scale doesn't work. So you can just type exit and that, that will close your project, which is quite handy as well. So how are we doing here? Zero. Okay, this is not right. Um, this is taking forever, so there's so obviously something that we didn't do. There's something might be too big or... So I'll just cancel. This should have taken just a moment. I'm gonna lower the settings even more and see what's going on. I didn't exit full screen, I exited the whole project, just type in exit, so I did, I closed the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, okay. right, I think this might have something to do with uh, what I'm doing wrong. Uh, just gonna keep it really simple.
Okay, I'm just gonna do a, another quick test if, see if it builds, if it builds, and we can talk a little bit about the uh, package. But uh, now that we don't have it grayed out, let's um, or maybe be, yeah, maybe before before we try that again, let's talk about the player controller and the game mode. So, so basically, Sergio, let me just say that at the jury um, on the 12th of December, basically the aim should be that your simulation is operational in a way that you could move around it with the human body. So that means that if you have things that are stairs or weird things, uh, humans can't fly. So we need ways for actually humans to get around. So this is what Sergio will. So there are two. There are two things for for. Uh, to make this possible, first of all, you need a, a you need to tell the engine how how the camera is behaving. So let's talk a little bit about cameras. So you can be a car, or you can be a you can have a first person camera or a third person camera, or you could be flying on a plane. So every type of game, let's say, or or game behavior needs a special type of game type and player controller. The player controller is gonna define how do you move in the world. So just for this example, let's try two different types. So you don't you're not gonna start programming anything at this point or, or not a complete character. So you can bring stuff into the engine uh, templates. If you go to add new add feature or content pack if you go to the blueprint features you have a first-person controller, a flying controller, a rolling ball controller, third-person, top-down, uh, well, a lot of stuff, vehicle. So we're gonna bring, just so you see the difference and how to change between them, we're gonna bring the third-person, the first-person, and the virtual reality one, just in case you need to make a, a start one from scratch. Are you gonna do VR for this presentation? No. Okay. In any case, I'm going to bring it because there is a thing that you need to know here about. So, I'm going to start with the first person, which is the most normal one. So, I'm going to go first person and add to project. And that's it. Just made those uh, new folders for me. Then I'm going to add the third person. Right? I'm going to close. So, now I have all I need for a first person character and a third person character in my game. So, how do I tell the game that this is the thing that it needs to use. Well, that is, going th that is done through a game mode. Um, if you go to the world settings, the first tab is the game mode. So right now, we don't have any game mode. If I select, obviously because I've imported those um, uh, templates, now I already have game mode, so I could say, uh, I want to start using the first person game mode. So if I select this and I expand this drop down here, right? Sorry, let me just check on my. Yeah, sorry, I'm not building. The game mode is in the world settings. Yep. Game mode. So what's important here is. Um, yeah, window world settings. So the world setting. So remember the layout that I recommend you to have is this one. Is the content browser close to the modes? Here the world line, the world outliner, and in a different tab the details and the world settings. Those two, you're never gonna use them at the same time, so you'll save some space there, but the world settings, it has to be there. So the game mode, <clears throat> when you apply the game mode, it's feeding automatically all those uh, sections. So the default point class, the HDD, player controller, blah, blah, blah. So the game mode is a blueprint. The pawn is another blueprint. The HD is, an, is another blueprint. So everything are blueprints. We're not gonna. We don't have time this 
uh, to talk about blueprints, but at least you should know what is this and how to make one from scratch. So if I, every time that you see a magnifying glass, if I click, it will take me to the place where that asset is in my content browser. So if I double click on the first person game mode blueprint, I'm gonna see that I, I get this simple or simplify blueprint where I can fill in those slots with other blueprints. The really important ones are the pawn class and the player controller. I, we can't really get into much detail into this, but the good thing is that you, you do have them available, basically. The player controller is defining how is defining how the peripherals that you're using, whether it's the mouse, the keyboard, the game controller or the motion controllers of VR, are gonna affect the player controller for you to move in the world. So for example, the player controller is gonna say, when I when I hit the W letter, you go forward. If I hit spacebar, you jump. That all this programming goes into the player controller. The player pawn is going to define how do I look in the world. So here, the default pawn class, it is the first person character. If I double click it, I'm going to see that I have arms and a gun and I'm breathing. So this is. So I have a camera that is in my head and everything else is here, right? So this is my first person character. So when I play, that's what I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see my arms. So the pawn class defines my look pretty much. It defines more stuff. It defines also that I can shoot and things like that. Let's just let me get out of here. So you see, I have a gun, I can jump, and I, I think it's, I can shoot as well. We obviously we don't want that, so we can't get rid of this. Well, you might want, but you might not. So we we need to get rid of this. So I'm going to show you two ways because it's important that you know the other way. One simple way, uh, it is changing the default pawn, pawn class. Because everyone is, or a lot of people is using this already for architectural visualization. Epic Games did a pawn class for ArchBis. So the ArchBis character, it has a similar behavior, but it doesn't have a gun, and the movement is a lot smoother. So I'm gonna take a screenshot of this. So if I play again, this should have taken a few seconds. So there is obviously something wrong in my scene. This light bake should have been like a moment. Uh, I would have to look into why it's taking so long. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, anyway, now my uh, art piece character, you see that the movement is a lot smoother I, I walk slower as well and I don't have a gun let's say that I wanted to sorry I'm gonna cancel this light bake well uh, I'm gonna make everything dynamic and I look into that I copy the scene and look into that um, Yeah, sorry. Uh, the pawn. So the archbis character. Sorry, pawn. The archbis character doesn't have the gun and is already more appropriate. But let's and say it doesn't have the big thing. It doesn't have that the normal game uh, cap uh, is that it shakes like this yeah. when you move, which is often actually quite annoying when you want to yeah. see a space and not simulate. A space. Yeah, in VR is horrible as well. So, but let's say that you actually, for some, whatever reason, you still want this character, but you just want to get rid of this. So this is really simple. You just need to open the first person character blueprint. Normally you'll start here. 
or there. So this is all the programming that is telling this character what to do. But if you go to the viewport and you select the arms, you see this mesh and you see this mesh and you can just come here, go to the render section and just say antique visible and that's it, right? Then, so you just need to make it invisible. You fall down. Yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll look into that right yeah, now. It's a collision the, error. You need a, a collision for the surface the, that you're standing on. Exactly. The interesting thing of uh, this first person character is that uh, we, we could change um, a lot of stuff here. We could change the speed, how we walk, the um, letter. So it's all, we have access to the programming part, let's say. So for example, let's say that we, we just want to disable the fire, but we want everything else. We could just unlink this, or we, cha we want to change the, the keys to jump. Uh, I would just go to the jump section and change the spacebar for something else. So this is just so you know that this thing exists. There is something else that you might want to uh, remove, which is uh, the crosshair. This, this, this red. red thing here, which is quite annoying, <clears throat> that is the head-up display, the HUD here, right? So you could just change the head-up display to nothing, right? Or you could keep using the first-person head-up display and change it for something else. So right now we are using this texture. But maybe you do want to. Maybe this is for your project, but you just want to change the texture. Well, you just you would have to go to the head-up display and change the texture here. So, question. Yep. Sorry. Why did you change to nothing? Where? To nothing. If you, if you go so, back and just so it's, everything is in the game mode, right? So if I don't want a head-up display class, I'll just go to none. HUV class, heads-up display. Right? Or if I want another one, I could make a new one. So that would be the uh, simplest game mode. Just for the sake of the explanation, I'm going to change the game mode to a third-person game mode. Could we maybe first, because this is probably going to be the most uh, important one, the first person. Yep. Is where you actually start, and just sorry, yeah, a very, very basic kind of uh, of this. The reason why why yes. you could run around now is because you created this plane. Which has a, a collision, collision. Yes, let's also. talk about collisions and let's talk about this thing. So yeah. let's say that you don't have anything on your scene that is telling you where to where to start. You need a thing that is called the player start. So you can go to modes and just type player start. You should have only one for now on your scene until you understand how to use multiple ones. Because if you have more than one, it will randomly pick one. So if you want to start in a specific place in your project, you need a player start. So you drag the player start you're seeing. So this is you in the world, and you need to put it wherever you want to start. So if I want to start here, that's my player start. When I hit play, that's where I'm going to start. And there is a little arrow, right, that shows in which direction you will be looking. Yeah, the, blue, the light blue one. So that, that is very important. So thanks because I forgot about that. So, so we have a player start and we have a game mode and a player controller. So the next thing that we need to, that we need to be able to navigate stuff is geometry with, colli with colliders. So for example, if I um, come here to the stuff that is already built in the engine, so if I go to geometry and I put this, those stairs, those stairs already have colliders, so I can go up them. But if you make your own stairs, if I make my own stairs, and I don't make collider, Um, sorry. <laughs> well, 
if I export this, I won't be able to. I won't be able to go up unless I make a collider for them. So if we went to do the example, I'm just going to export this thing. Did we talk about colliders the other day? Um, not much, but when we introduced Unreal at the very beginning, that was one of the first things mm -hmm. that we we just showed how to like how to remove the, the collision okay. because from Rhino they came in very weird. So yeah. Well, that's big. So they know what it is and how to remove so one. So maybe we can try to make one. Uh, so I make an absolutely huge, well, all right, so I won't be able to go up those stairs, let's just demonstrate. Okay, guys, you just walk straight. So there is no collider, there's a really handy shortcut, Alt-C, that will show me the, uh, sorry, the colliders on the scene. So if I get close to where well, you see that uh, purple thing around, that is the collider. So let's say that I brought this into the engine and it doesn't have a collider. So I'm going to show you the good way and the fast way. I tend to do a lot of colliders inside of Unreal because it's just really fast and normally works really well. So let's double click on our new stir and go to the, well, I made it super So cheap. you can use one of your geometries in Unreal to follow this. Okay. Yeah, super huge. So if we go to the collision tab, if your if your object is really simple, if your object is simple, like it's just a volume and like something that we can assimilate to a capsule or a box or something really simple, we would use the simplified collisions, right? So let's say that I don't really want to go up those sisters. I just want to block uh, the volume. So I don't go through, but I don't go up. I would probably use a simplified collision, like uh, 26 uh, DOP. I don't know exactly what it is, but it would just make a simple volume. So I'm going to add this one and see what it does. Cool. It just makes a volume that surrounds my object. So, so you see these green lines here? So this thing is not going to allow me to go up the stairs, but it will block me from going through, right? So let me just show, if I type on my console, show collision. Oh. Just one. Well, it's not showing. Anyway, uh, you see it there. I'm just going to go and I can pass. Right? And it's blocking me. But if I do want to go up the stairs, I could go collision, re delete, delete, delete selected collision. I could try to make a more complex one. So those ones, you do them with the auto convex collision. So when I hit auto convex collision, now I get this new window here. Convex decomposition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the sliders all the way up so to, to get the most accurate possible collision. And I'm going to say that the, I want also the maximum number of whole vertices. So I'm going to go all the way up. Those, this is the maximum that I can do because obviously a collider shouldn't be very complex because how collisions are calculated is basically that we're throwing rays in the world all the time. So it's doing ray casting. So if it throws 
rays and it hits a really dense mesh, it will take a lot of time to calculate. So that's why collisions should be simple. So I'm going to hit apply and see what I get. Cool, I got a really nice uh, collision mesh. And this is going to allow me to go up my esters nicely. So now I can go be careful because I don't have a hand rate. The thing is, I say joking, but if we would have made a handrail in the same mesh, the collision would have been really bad because it would be way too complex. So what I'm going to show you is a trick now that I use a lot. Well, it's not a trick. It's just something really handy. So that's cool, right? So you need collision for every object that we want to collide with. Let's say that my object was a lot more complex. Maybe um, my object, let me just make a copy of this. Maybe my object was uh, something like that. Why he does this? Basically, if you have anything that is convex, it, Unreal will have a lot of hard times calculating that, like things that are. Yeah, there is a okay. there is a simple. So if you go, U for. But it's a simple image. I should help us to. Or just go to the official documentation. What's a good Yeah. So this is this is <laughs> easy to understand. Mm -hmm. This is a good collision, this is a bad collision. This will never work. You can't have a convex. So if you have this, you're better off splitting this collision mesh in two. Okay? So if our object was uh, more complex and we had a lot of objects or whatever, there was something like that and we would try to make an automatic collision mesh with this, uh, it wouldn't, it would be quite bad, it wouldn't really work. So if this was my object, probably what I would do is manually um, Let me do it quickly. Maybe I'll, I'll do the example with just a couple of them. I would probably make uh, boxes manually that I would modify. Let's say I'm just gonna do it with those three steps. So I would do my collision in 3D Max and I would copy paste the collision from a simple object to a complex object, right? So I'm just gonna do this really, really quick. Uh, so I'm gonna attach those those meshes together because they're gonna be part of the same collision. Right, so I would do um, tools. So I could just try to make a really simple version of my step. You don't, for collisions, it doesn't have to be super, super accurate. So you will not suggest treating simple as, or complex collisions as simple? You, uh, you, the collisions always, the collision objects always have to be really simple. You can have a, you shouldn't have a complex object because it will take forever to calculate. It will slow down the In process. Fact, what you might do for something like this, it could for a staircase that goes straight, you don't need each step. It could just be a ramp. Yeah, totally. Because otherwise you will get this jump 
like the camera will jump up and down every with every step. So the simpler it is, the, the better. better. Yeah. What I'm trying to explain here is two things: how to export a collision mesh from 3D Max or other package, just in case, and how to copy paste a collision mesh from one of you to another. So this is very important. Let's say that I did all the steps. I'm only doing three parts. Uh, this is called, I'm going to call it uh, Esther Complex. My collision object needs to be called exactly the same, Esther Complex, but with the prefix UCX. So a UCX underscore Esther Complex and UCX Esther Complex. When I export them at the same time, and real will know that the one with the UCX prefix it is a collision. So if I now export this thing, file export selected as stir complex. When I import into Unreal, now if I see my collision, I see the steps, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this collision from this object into this other object, just so you know how it works. So here, let's say that I don't have the collision. If I select in my content browser this object, the complex one, and then I go to the non-complex one, I go collision, copy collision from selected static mesh, then it brings me the collision. This is a really good trick. It's like, for example, I was asking because what I've been doing so far is on the right hand side, I'll scroll down. So on the details navigation bar, yeah. I'll scroll down until I see the, the object. Is, yeah, and there on the collisions, I'll go to the drop down list, yeah. collision complexity, and use complex as simple. And that's like a one click, and then I hit apply. Well, that is really dangerous and really inefficient because yeah. you are using too, way, way, way too many polygons to do a simple calculation. So if a ray cast hits a simple object, it will do it fast. If you need to, you are working in a really complex object, it's, it's ray casting all the time in, in an unnecessary thing that it could be just a play. I mean, if we're talking a box, yes. But if you're talking about an object that is just a little bit complex, this is a huge waste, so I wouldn't do it. Can I change a collision everything at the same time, so that everything can change it, or I have to do it one by one? You mesh by mesh. Okay. So yeah, every individual mesh. Okay. But there is also a way to, for instance, that Ludwig's example here is great because there is this kind of round shape, but it's made out of many, 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 many small mm. pieces of geometry. So if you ever want to be able to walk up, you don't want the camera to be jumping at every mm -hmm. step. So you could import a geometry that is just a collision and then basically make it invisible to yeah, as well. broadcast shadow. So you could just be like a little bowl or something. Yeah, let's or say... Or a series of them. Absolutely. So let's say that, for example, your... Yeah, whatever. I mean, can be anything. This box is your... Uh, well, the good thing of... The volumes that I was explaining before is that you can make, um, you can block out geometry here as well. So I could just make a ramp really quickly in Unreal. So you, you can actually model in Unreal. Um, but we're not going to get into that. But let's say that I've decided that this is my, um, this is the invisible geometry that is going to allow me to go up my stairs. Whoops. What I'll have to do is uh, say that I say, sorry take my geometry and say that I want to I want it hidden in game. Well, I'm trying. Sorry, I'm using a special type. So I just got with this one. If if I have an object and I want to use it as collision but not see it, I can just go to the rendering tab and say that I want the actor hidden in game. So for example, we are seeing here the stairs. We are not in the game right now. If we say hidden in game, when we start playing, I don't see it. 
So that would be my invisible collider, right? But the collider still works. So that's that's the yeah. yes, exactly. So let's see. I'm gonna go up the invisible stairs. So that will be. They are around here. There you go. Yeah, you can't really see it. But the point would be that you you would like model a few really basic things to use as collision. All right, so yeah, anything that you want to work on uh, requires a collider. So, and to be honest, I think you're gonna get away most of the time with the um, auto convex collision. It normally does a pretty good job. Right, so just really quickly, um, I'm going to show you the third person so you see how you can change, and then we come back to the first person character. So we did import the third person controller. Changing to this one, it will be as simple as changing here because it's gonna fill everything automatically for us. So now we have a, a third person character that it is just um, a bit weird. But sometimes it's cool for scale. I mean, it definitely helps understand the... Does it have any built in like that ourselves with. Yeah, that's quite cool though to introduce that. Yeah, but how to link it to this is and how to make it actually yeah. So you can you have to introduce people, but to introduce that. But to change the character. Change the character to change the character you would need a character, so you could you could go so the, the only easy way for you to do this and free would be to go to there is a free on the marketplace that is the oh, that's, that's the practice. Uh, to open the marketplace. That's weird. You know well, that you can you click. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So if you type mix samo, so you have this free animation pack, and it has a few, well, mainly monsters, but it have it has a couple of humans as well. But you could. Well, those characters are. So this pack, as an example, they are all animated. You just need to replace the mesh. So you, you could use those ones. Otherwise, you would have to either buy one or create one. But yeah, we can create one. Uh, yeah, you can create one and change this robot. So the third person. So in the same way that we change the arms, you could come here. You have this guy. You could just change this guy for another guy, as long as it respects the same skeleton. But I'm not gonna get into this. Oh, yeah. It's just out yeah. of curiosity. Uh, so let's go back to the first person. And now, yeah, because I, I would expect just generally that third person would only be in certain ways to view it, because it's not the way we actually experience hmm. the world. No? So. so Let's uh, so basically this is different ways of manipulating a camera, right? At the end, so there's a camera that is moving with our mouse and the keyboard. But if we want just regular cameras and, uh, and do animations, um, yeah, let's talk about that. So we have half an hour to because I really want to explain answer as well. So just in case I don't have time. If, if we run out of time, you need to, on your own, go to, later on, go to Edit, Plugins, go all the way down, because uh, this is extremely important. Photography, activate Ansel, and then you go to YouTube and find a tutorial on how to activate it. There is a, really, there is a good one. You can't imagine how useful is this thing. It's just the best. So do it. So you go UE4 Ansel. So by the if you want to use Ansel in your own computers, you it can only be used with NVIDIA graphic cards because it was made by NVIDIA. So just so you know. So this first one here, 
this first tutorial will teach you how to activate Amazon. Once it's activated, it's only once. Once it's activated, you um, you play the game, hit Alt, Alt F2, and it brings the Amstel console. And it's just like, if you play games, it's like any in-game photography. Uh, do you, who plays games? You play games. Who else? You play games, so you know that it's now it's very trendy in-game photography. So this is the plugin that is used to do in-game photography. So you're playing, the game pauses, you have a camera that you can fly around, change the camera angle, apply effects. The, the amazing thing is that you can do unlimited resolution of stills, 360s and 360 stereos, that instantly, which is unheard. It's just magic. So do it. Uh, really, really important. I'll just take a screenshot. So I know, yeah, probably we won't have time, but anyway. Right, so just to link to what we're doing, so this is the first person, this is the third person controller, and this is the first person controller. So in the first person controller, I have a camera attached to my head, and this um, a capsule here is uh, representing my body. Here, I have this character and a camera following me. So at the end, those are different ways of, I'm just gonna close everything, of controlling a camera, right? So let's just talk about the cameras themselves and how to uh, manipulate them while we are not playing. Or while we are playing, but that will require programming. Sorry, just before I, just really quickly before I uh, forget, since that was also a camera. So that little cube camera that we put at the beginning, Scene Capture Cube 2D. So this is a special camera that makes 360 images. And we we put it here just for the example, but it's a really useful way of using it as well. So just really quickly. So this <clears throat> this camera was making this, it is making this 360 images in real time. So this texture here is dynamic and I can use it, but I can make it cheaper if I right click and say, create static texture. Once I do this, this is a normal texture that anything else that I've done before. So if I take a material, um, like this one, and I take that texture, this texture is, is a 360, so it's kind of a special one. If I input a a custom reflection vector and I add this to any reflective part of my material, this will help me to enhance the reflections of the scene. So I can fake glass really well with this. If I multiply this, for example, by my color and I put it in the color, what I'm doing basically is I'm, I'm forcing a reflection onto my material. I'm forcing this, I know it's difficult to see until we put it, but this setup would allow us to make a really nice glass. So, so you put yourself in the position where the glass object is gonna be taking the Take the through, exactly. It doesn't have to be really accurate. It's kind of uh, in the area because we're not, we're feeding it as a, as a help because we also have real reflections. Just wanted to explain quickly that this is a really nice, uh, way of faking reflections. There is another way also, right? just the reflection... Well, the reflection probe, actually, ah, we didn't even talk about that, sorry. Um, the reflection probes, yeah, two sessions is not really a lot. <laughs> uh, the reflection probes are mandatory, it's not really... Um, so, I thought we put a... The other way. So, This, in our scene, at least, we need to have a box reflection capture, sorry, and a sphere reflection capture is where I want things to reflect properly. So a box reflection capture is gonna make a box projection of my scene and it's gonna automatically fit it into my shaders. 
So this should be covering. Um, I'm just gonna do it manually. So if I surround my scene with this box reflection capture, well, it should be tight and it should be in the interior, it will help uh, give me nice reflections in my object. So this is mandatory. At least a few sphere of reflections that it, it gives me more like localized. Um, so those points, you just need to change the scale and place them wherever you want to your reflective materials to get the reflections from. This will automatically feed the reflections into your materials. What we're doing here is forcing it even more. In this case, we're, we're giving it a little bit more, more push of something that we specifically want. If I, ha if I was to make this scene here, I would take this reflection cup box, scale it down so I can have my box covering the whole interior. Something like that. And then I would put localized sphere reflection captures where I want a little bit more detail. So maybe like 350 in this case. I would put a few of those right like that where I want more localized. So maybe if we make this material reflective, it will be easier to show. If I move this, you'll see how the reflection change, right? So yeah, this is basically also making 360s and fitting them, but they're really cheap. So you can put a lot of them. Okay, so you need to do a combination of box reflection captures and sphere reflection captures. The, the planar reflection, <clears throat> this is a special type that, um, well, I'm not going to talk about that one because we're going to run out of time. Let's jump into cameras a little bit. Uh, so if we go to, to the cinematic area, we have the cine camera actor, camera recreate, a camera recreate. But we also have a regular camera. If we type camera, we have this one. So the cinema camera actor is like a, a better version of this camera. So maybe you just use the cinema camera actor. So if we want, if you want to make renders or animations, you first are going to have to place a, a camera actor in your scene, right? So then wherever you point the camera, obviously like in any software in the world, you're going to get a view of that. So the cool thing is that you get a preview of the camera here. <clears throat> but maybe you want to start uh, seeing through the eyes of the camera. So the cool thing, one of the cool things that is also dangerous in Unreal is that you can manipulate the camera as if you were playing. So that is called piloting the camera. So if I go here, or actually, sorry, if I right click on the camera and I say pilot, I'm gonna take the view of the camera and now when I move, I'm moving the camera. So I can I can do the camera angle that I like. Let's say that's say okay cool. You need to right click on the camera. Let's say that I decide this is a cool angle for me.
So let's say that I decide this is a, a good camera angle. Now I need to be careful because if I keep moving, I'm moving the camera. So I need to get out of the pilot. So this icon here, this eject icon. So now my camera is in place. Camera is there. Yep. And now what I can do is I can start modifying the, uh, the, um, the parameters of my camera. I still get the preview, which is cool, but now I can come here and use it as a, uh, as a real camera. So the difference between the cinema camera actor and the other camera is the other camera is more like a CGI camera that is faking stuff. This one is giving you proper value. So if any of you is into photography, this will be a lot easier to use, right? So I can put my my type of camera, I can change the lens, I can change the focus. So those camera settings are like in any camera in the world. <clears throat> what I get after, it is very similar to what you're gonna encounter in a post-process volume. So a camera can override a post-process volume. So what I, that's really useful because I can have a white balance, for example, per camera, right? that is overriding the post-process volume. That is really useful, so I'm not modifying this, the entire scene. So what I, I can do, post-process per camera. I can come here and decide that this camera has a higher exposure. Just this camera, so that's really useful. But it's also really useful because I can animate all those parameters. And that's how you make a movie, right? So how do you do that? Well, there are two ways. One is the old one and one is the new one. Obviously, you should start using the, the new one, but you should know that the old one exists just in case you see it somewhere. One is called Matine and the other one is called Sequencer. Sequencer is the new one. So if you want to make camera animations, try to use Sequencer and not Matine. Matine is easier but uh, sequencer is better. So sequencer, a sequence is a file. So before you start making an animation, you have to actually make the sequence. I will recommend you making a new folder we use called sequences. <clears throat> and inside of the new folder, right click and go new assets and go to Uh, level so in animation level sequence. The sequences are per level, obviously, because you are animating stuff within your level, right? So, level sequence, you see it? New asset animation level sequence. Yep. Cool. All right, so I'm making my sequence and I name it whatever. I'm gonna call it uh, camera animation. You can animate anything on the level sequence, not only cameras, you can animate characters, the sun, uh, box, changing material or color, whatever you want. They, everything works in the same way. So when you have your sequence and double click in the sequence, you get a new UI that I tend to put here because it's, I don't know, seems comfortable to me. But if you want to have it standalone or really big, you can put it there. You can put it wherever you want. I just find it comfortable here. So how does this work? Have you done any timeline animation in any software like Premiere or whatever? Well all the timelines animations are similar so you, you need a track to animate stuff so first of all we're gonna make a new track and when you create a new track it will ask you what is the type of track so by default you have a audio track event track camera card track short track blah 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 lots of stuff for now 
let's make a actor to sequencer. So what we can do is make a track for the camera that we already have on the scene. This is our scene, so we could just find our camera, which is called Cinema Camera Actor 1, and make a track with this camera. Now that we have a track for this camera, right? I have lots of parameters that I can see already I can animate. For example, the transform of the camera, the, lo the location, rotation, or scale of the camera. So let's say that, let's start by animating this camera. So this will be really simple. If I activate, sorry, let me find, if I activate uh, the auto key, So I just want this to automatically make a keyframe every time that I change something. And is it this one? Cool, yes. So this button here. is gonna automatically start adding keyframes when I change my camera, I think. Oh no, sorry, am I doing it? Let me see what I'm doing wrong. This should be... This should be doing keyframes for me. Isn't it this? Is the... Uh, that magnet? No, it's not. It's not. No, I could swear that... Uh, I believe you just have to create the first one yourself on location and then after that it starts creating them automatically. If uh -huh. you have the key selected, create the first one. Okay, that's why, right? Okay. And cool. then when you move this scroll and move the camera, it does. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. So we do have to have the auto key, which is this one here, activated. And we do have to select to make the first key for everything that I want to animate. In this case, we want location and rotation. So we're going to make the first keyframe for each one of them. So it's this little dot so here. Click this little button instead. If we click the plus, it has a new keyframe. So that is a keyframe. So timeline animation, how it's going to work is I'm, I'm making a keyframe saying in this, at this time in the timeline my camera is in this position and is rotated this value and then I move along in the timeline so I'm going to say at 50 frames, this is not seconds, this is frame although we could change to seconds, right? At 50 frames, which is 2 seconds and now I'm piloting the camera at 50 seconds, I'm going to be here, and I, I've moved and rotated, right? So now, I already have my camera animated. If I go back, so if I go now to frame 100, another 2 seconds, I could go here. And is, is it, oh, it's following the path that you... Well, it's, it's now he's piloting the camera. So I'm piloting the camera. It's following the path that you follow. Well, I didn't follow any path. I, I moved freely. Oh, and it makes so it's interpolating. It's only interpolating. I didn't create a path. Let's make a path now, but I didn't yeah. create a path. It's interpolating between three positions. So this was my initial position. This was the second, and this was the third. So it's just taking those three points and then like making a smooth path. It's not taking any of the in-between points. Mm -hmm. No. Is interpolating between them according to those curves. It's automatically making up curves to smooth and. But I could say that I want this smooth, so I could select my keys and say, instead of automatically interpolate, go linearly from one to the other, or let me let me control it manually, so I can actually change the. Um, 
the uh, curves between points. So this is going to be dramatically different now. You'll see how the animation is so, so different, right? It's bouncing the values. It's going up in its value. So it's not going smoothly from one to the other, right? So the safest thing is just to go always auto. So it's going to give you the is in and out softer values. So we've, we've animated here. So you, guys, I went there clicking in this button here. So that's how you see the curves. So we've, we've uh, animated the transform. But let's say that at this point, I want to start animating, for example, the exposure of our camera. I can come here and add a track for, uh, sorry here and add a track for the exposure that should be somewhere Post -processing. there you go lens auto exposure and what I want to change is the uh, exposure bias which is how I'm controlling my exposure right so now what I'm saying is add frame zero my exposure is the current exposure and at frame whatever I'm gonna change it to uh, zero. The cool thing is that the keys I can move them as well right so I can move the key and say I really want it at frame 50 to be zero and then at frame 100 I want it to be minus five so now if I play, I see the exposure changing. And I can, do, I can do a track for pretty much anything. So if I go to the camera component, track, and I go to, where are we again? Post process, I can change anything here. I can obviously change the, the lens of the camera. <laughs> Well, you see, a million things. Let's say that we want to uh, animate an object that is not the camera. I could add a new track. Let's add any object in the scene that is easier to animate or to visualize. Let's just make a, let's just make a sphere, let's make it a bit big. So what we could do uh, is make a new track for this sphere and say that, for example, what we want is to change the scale. So I will, we can make a frame zero, the scale is 50. In frame 50, the scale is 10, for example. Or maybe more interesting, what we could do as well uh, for frame 100, let's change back the scale to that. And we're also going to make a track of the sphere so we can change the material. So we could, uh, we could do a, There you go. So here, I could change if my material had a parameter. So I'm going to change. I'm going to give my sphere uh, a material with a parameter. So this parameter is the color. My sphere element zero. 
I can change the color to if I make a track. I'm changing the values of the color of the sphere as well. You see the so, see that so here we're changing this shape of the sphere and also the color. We're animating the color. So we can animate pretty much anything that we want, right? So now, how do we export this? Because we have five minutes, so we're going to have to work really quickly. <laughs> because today I can't stay longer. I need to rush. Uh, right, we have our sequencer. And now if we want to export this as an, as an animation, uh, we, we have this button here, rendered as a movie or image frame sequence. So we get this very handy menu which we can say, so when I render, I always render to frames. I never render as a video sequence because if it crashes, you lose everything. So it's better to render as image sequence and then you get the, you put them together in Premiere. So render as image sequence, put your frame rate, which is always gonna be 25 or 30. Your resolution, which I would do at least full HD, right? Um, best quality, you find your, you put your folder, there and da, 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 mm, capture movie. So now it should start. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's capturing. We are gonna. What is happening here is that basically when we play the game, we are still controlling the camera. The animation is not played. So what we're going to have to do is, actually, we need to do a little bit of blueprints here. In the level blueprint, we actually have to say, when you play the game, instead of letting me control the character, we need to play the animation. So when I capture the movie, it is playing the animation. So there is a special type of blueprint that is called the level blueprint. So that is this kind of global level here, where you can access stuff that is in the level. For example, my uh, sequence. So my sequence here, I can put it in the level and say auto play. That would be one option. Actually, maybe we don't even need to do blueprints. Do we? No. Yeah. We need to. We need to access it. So I have. I'm gonna, I can access my camera anim level sequence, make a reference to it. So I can right click and say create a reference to the camera anim. And now I can drag from the pin and say play sequence. And now there are uh, some simple nodes that I can use, for example, the even event begin play. So this this means as soon as the game starts, execute this command, which is play my sequence, right? So what I'm saying, let's see if it works. When I play, ah, crash. It's not play my animation because So 
Or let me just see really quickly why this is not playing. Honestly, I have no clue why it's not playing because this is correct. Um, how to play? Is that that then the new versions you need a master sequence? Or I found a master sequence. I there is maybe you're right. Hmm. Let me try and render from the master sequence, and I think it just you don't. I'm not sure if you, in the new versions you need to go through all of that changing there. Could be, yeah, maybe you're right. No. Well, the animation place, <laughs> it's just not that right. Uh, hmm, sorry about that. Just uh, strange because it's playing the sphere animation, but not the camera animation. Yeah. I think I may have something, may have done something wrong with the camera. Uh, it's movable. Mm, let me see. Okay. Versions just create the master sequence and automatically creates a camera and we just use that one and then yeah. when you render from there then it's just all yeah. doing it. I think if I add my camera this should this should work. I'm not looking through my camera. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna have to look into this. And I've done something wrong with the camera, but I don't know exactly what's the problem. But what uh, the way that you're doing it is probably a lot easier. So if okay, let's try to do it 
from scratch really quickly. So if we go to cinematics and we are a master sequence, uh, we can fill the parameters, we create the master, or maybe I, I need I to delete it. Really We're going to have to delete all the sequences. Just close this sequence. So we can directly create a new camera from here. So this one is going to animate. So uh, we can, in the same way, we're still we're already piloting it. So whatever we do with it, uh, we add the first transform, right? It should do it right. So I think I might have to deactivate my first person controller. Well, for some reason doesn't want to take control of my camera so I'll look into that and I can uh, I can copy this project well I'll make a new one I'll send you a project with the correct setup. Because okay. I don't know, I think I guess because I'm rushing it, I don't know exactly what I'm doing wrong with the camera. The ways of animating it, you've seen that that's, uh, sorry. That's, that's pretty simple. So you just move along the timeline placing keyframes. Uh, why we are not taking control of the camera right now, I'm not entirely sure. But once See, once we take control of the camera, it should be it should be fairly easy. Just gonna do a last test. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> I'll find out what was the was the issue with the sequencer. Okay. Uh, one quick question. Um, if it's something they do, otherwise don't worry about it. Um, I've created my floor from multiple different blocks. Mm -hmm. Your floor. Yeah. And so when it builds the lighting, it almost builds it. It's weird that the shadows stop at the edge of one. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's the other floor is lit. So one floor is shadow, as if there's like a wall between our other objects which I'm not seeing. The, are, are all your objects static? You have it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 